Since the launch of ChatGPT, it's clear that what once seemed to be the stuff of science fiction is here now with the potential to transform our lives. Some say artificial intelligence will enhance human capacity and well-being. Others, including some of the very researchers developing the new technology, warn it could drive humanity to extinction. They're calling on policymakers to act quickly and decisively to regulate risks. But is that even possible for machines capable of learning at a pace that far outstrips human intelligence? Do the benefits of AI in education, medicine, and elsewhere outweigh the perils? We're asking artificial intelligence. Are machines poised to take control? Hello and welcome to To The Point. It is a great pleasure to introduce our guests. Raul Rojas is Professor for Intel of Artificial Intelligence at the Free University of Berlin, working on technologies including autonomous driving, bionics and brain-computer interfaces. Janos Delker is Deutsche Welle's Chief Technology Correspondent. And joining us virtually from Hamburg is Judith Simon. She's professor for ethics in IT at the University of Hamburg, and she also sits on the German Ethics Council. And it's a great honor to welcome a special guest, a pioneering researcher who's been referred to as the father of modern AI. He's scientific director at the renowned AI lab, IDSIA. Jürgen Schmidhuber joins us virtually from Switzerland. And let me ask uh, all of you to just give us a very quick take on how you see this balance between, uh, between risks and benefits. Um, Raul, the scientists' warning of possible extinction compare AI to societal scale risks such as pandemics and even nuclear war. Would you agree? Well, I think that's a little exaggerated. The, the risks I see are more... Uh, they come from everyday life. I see risk uh, regarding employment. What are we going to do with people who is being displaced by new information technologies? I see risk regarding information, what is true and what is not true when we read something on the internet. I see risk regarding isolation of people, privacy. I see risk of this type and I think that regulation is required. And I, I, I think that uh, the extermination of humankind is is further down uh, and is more related possibly to climate change than to AI. Thank you. And we'll come back to regulation uh, a little bit later. Let me go over to Judith, if I may. And as an IT ethicist, what risks worry you the most? And do you see the balance between these and potential benefits as more negative or more positive? I see it quite balanced because if you think about it, AI is, is a basic technology that can be used for various purposes. We're talking about pattern recognition mostly for, for various purposes. So it has lots of advantages, lots of disadvantages, of course, as well, depending on how it is used. And I think much of the debate is to a certain degree shirking a bit of responsibility by portraying AI as this natural force, by focusing on this very long-term detriments, by while well, we should actually look at how AI is currently already being used and implemented and what the current threats are, both in terms of bias and discrimination, but also infringements of privacy. And, and of course, you know, not downplaying the positive side, but to focus more on these very concrete, immediate dangers instead of looking very far ahead into the future. Thank you very much. And uh, over to Janosch. And the warnings have proliferated since the launch of the chatbot, the dialogue technology, ChatGPT. Why is that? This technology, of course, has been in development for a long time now. That's very true. I think one um, you know, particular reason is that ChatGPT and its web interface makes it very much approachable for everyone. Everybody can use it. You know, you just enter a query and then you get an answer. And that is sort of very um, close to the reality of people. And um, I think that's one key aspect. The other aspect is that we're now seeing that AI technology is also coming for the work of knowledge workers, of white collar workers, if you will, yeah. lawyers, journalists, um, diplomats, for example. The people and, at this table. Yes. Very true, very, very true. And I think those are the two key reasons why there's so much attention on this issue now. 
and indeed many of us have become uh, amateur uh, IT behavioral researchers in the sense that <laughs> we're going to chat GPT and testing it and seeing if we can beat it, um, and we'll come back to that a bit later. Generative AI like that, which is driving chat GPT, is still in its early days. It's sometimes loony and erroneous missteps have provoked as much snickering as worry. The products of its creativity may look harmless, but they are convincing, and therein lies danger. A lot of people thought this photo of Pope Francis in a luxurious puffer jacket was real, but you can tell by the distortion of his fingers it was AI. Whether it's Russian President Vladimir Putin kneeling in front of Chinese leader Xi Jinping, or ex-US President Donald Trump getting arrested by the police. Lies and manipulation are only a few keyboard clicks away. AI tools like Midjourney and Dall-E create photorealistic images that can even fool professionals sometimes. This image won photographer Boris Eldogsen a Sony World Photography Award, but he turned down the prize because he created the image with AI to spark a debate. What does it mean when you can no longer trust what you see in pictures? And in fact, you can find more information on how to spot AI-generated images on our DWCOM innovation site with fact-checking. And one of those who's worried about precisely that risk is the CEO of the company at the center of the storm, the co-founder of OpenAI, whose technology powers ChatGPT. If this technology goes wrong, it can go quite wrong. Uh, and we want to be vocal about that. We want to work with the government to prevent that from happening. It's one of my areas of greatest concern, the, 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 the more general ability of these models to manipulate, to persuade, uh, to provide sort of one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you know, interactive disinformation. And let me go over now to Professor Schmidt Huber and ask how I can be certain that you yourself are real and not an AI-generated avatar. For now, you will have to take my word for it. On the other hand, what is the value of the word of an avatar? <laughs> you, you didn't sign the open letters that have been floating around the internet, and I gather from what you said elsewhere that you see more promise than peril in artificial intelligence. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm an optimist, and um, um, I uh, refer to all the cases where AI is already making human lives longer and healthier and easier. Now, uh, many of those who are now warning, they are mostly seeking attention because they know that um, AI dystopia are um, uh, grabbing more attention than documentaries about the benefits of AI in healthcare. What about AI-supported weapon systems? Have you no concern that there's danger in an autonomous system that makes split-second decisions where no human oversight can adequately control or second-guess what's going on in that black box? It is true that we have new types of weapons. You can buy yourself a drone for 300 euros and uh, maybe attach a little gripper to it and then uh, fly it over to your neighbor's um, uh, ground and then maybe uh, put some poison into his coffee or something like that. On the other hand, the police is using the same technology to uh, track that and you, uh, we have an existing regula regulatory framework uh, of laws that make you go to jail in case you get caught. I'm much more worried about 60-year-old uh, 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 truly existential threats in form of um, hydrogen bombs, uh, which can uh, wipe out 10 million people um, within one flash without any AI. Let me ask you about another uh, risk that concerns many people. In the classic science fiction dystopia, ro robots uh, essentially run amok. You yourself created a form of artificial curiosity that definitely could outstrip human intelligence. In fact, that's your aim. Are we really able to implant in such applications an ethical compass to ensure that no matter how they develop, they will do no harm? 
Well, as long as you um, know as a programmer what is that ethical compass, uh, you can program it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you put 10 ethicists in one room and they have 10 different opinions about what is ethical and what's not. Uh, so uh, as long as humans um, don't get that act together and agree on what is uh, ethically correct and what isn't, um, I see um, uh, little hope that you can um, um, build an AI that implements that thing which is not well defined. And um, we will, in fact, see whether human beings can get together to do the necessary policy making and regulation a little bit later in the discussion. But let me ask you one last question, and it relates to the world of work, which Raoul mentioned as one of his key concerns. How do we make sure that job loss doesn't produce massive social destabilization? Mm. We have a long history um, that uh, shows what happens when jobs are lost. Six, well, let me see, 200 years ago, um, almost all jobs were in agriculture. 60% of all people were in agriculture, and today it's maybe 1.5%. Um, nevertheless, the unemployment rates are really low in the Western world, maybe 5% or something like that, because lots of new jobs were created. And this is going on as we speak. All the time, new jobs are being created because Homo ludens, the playing man, likes to invent new ways of interacting with other people and making jobs, professional activities out of that. Uh, so that's not going to stop. And as long as you keep learning um, to, to adapt to the new situation, um, you, you, wouldn't, you won't have to worry. Professor Schmidt-Huber, thank you very much for joining us on the program. With my pleasure. Thank you. And let me now get a take from the three of you on what was clearly a very techno-optimistic uh, perspective on AI. And I'd like to begin, if I may, uh, with Raoul and pick up on any point uh, that you wish to address. But also, i definitely like to hear your take on the weapons systems, because clearly AI could be used to augment and support larger as well as smaller weapons systems and thereby shrinks the window for de-escalation in a confrontational situation. Yeah, yes, of course. Uh, information technology and artificial intelligence are dual use, are dual technology. You can use them to improve the quality of life of people or you can use them for weapon systems. And many people have protested in the past about the use of weapons in general and, and, and more uh, to the point of this program uh, about the use of artificial intelligence for weapons. But I, I see the problems right now more in everyday life, as I said before. I see the problem in, in jobs. The, the current te technological revolution is, much, is going much faster than it was going in the, in, in the second industrial revolution or the first. Uh, it took 100 years for the telephones to take over, for example, in the US, so that everybody had a telephone. It took 70 years for more than half of the population to have a car. It took also 100 years for the electrical network to be distributed in the US. Now it takes 10 years for smartphones to be more than people. It takes uh, two weeks for ChatGTP to have 10 million users. So the, the acceleration of the process is such that we have to be aware that this is not like 200 years ago, uh, 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 before. It's not like the second industrial revolution or the first one. And uh, you did, Simon, I must say, I've just been in Brussels talking to some of the EU policymakers who will be negotiating uh, the new the EU uh, legislation on AI. And that speed that Raul just described is absolutely one of the major concerns. So let me ask you, in a technology moving this fast, how hard is it to get under the hood, as one might say, and understand exactly how the algorithms arrive at the outputs that they produce. Because if we want to try to ensure accountability and also ethical behavior on the part of AI, clearly we need to understand what's inside. Yeah, the problem is really that many of these large systems are not understandable. You can't really understand how systems reach their decisions, what how they make their predictions. Uh, I don't think that we will have to have explainability for all, in order to ensure um, 
accountability or regulation in all forms. So I think there must be forms of regulation and accountability, even if we don't understand the systems, right? So for certain systems, we may require explainability, but this can only go so far, right? So we may say, for instance, in the judicial system, but also maybe in science, we may want to understand how system reached certain conclusions, but there's a price to pay very often in terms of maybe accuracy, so explainability in terms of XI doesn't does come as a cost. So we will have to decide where we need it and where we don't need it and for what reasons. But I think apart from that, we need to have regulation in place, irrespective of the question whether you can always look under the hood. Mm -hmm. And I want to come back to the regulatory issue, but let me ask you another question about the technology itself. I recently uh, had uh, the interesting task of, uh, of a dialogue with the chief technical officer of OpenAI, and she said that even as generative AI is now moving toward multimodality, that means processing not just language but images, sound inputs, and, and much more, that it will still remain prone to what she called delusions. What does that mean? That we must essentially, uh, because you talked about uh, explanatory capacity, but if AI is ready to lie, who can explain? Yeah, I think what people must understand is the way these systems function. What happens is basically, if you just think of ChatGPT, Chat GPT, so this the system is analyzing large amounts of data and is trying to understand how text is structured how certain types of texts, such as novels or crime stories, but also sort of like communication is structured and it produces highly plausible content, but without any relation to truth. So everything that has been generating is just plausible patterns uh, of content, be it speech patterns or be it pictures. And that explains why we have these delusions, because the whole underlying thing is not representing something that is existing, but making up something out of patterns. And if you understand this rationale, then it becomes obvious that, of course, it will continue to do so. You may be you know, ch changing certain issues in order to feed in uh, sources for text, et cetera, but underlying the whole system is just a generation of plausible content, but not of truth. And um, Janusz, that takes us back essentially to the short report that we saw earlier on the deep fakes on these pictures and images that look very convincing, but in fact are simply also lies. Um, there is certainly a double threat to democracy here, say many uh, observers. Both those kind of images and the degree to which they can be used for propaganda, disinformation, manipulation, but then also the whole other set of issues around the future of work and, and job loss. How do we get out in front of that? How should we respond proactively? Yeah, that's true, because the genie is out of the bottle, and now it's about how to react. Um, I think there are two ways that are important. First, it's important to promote what you could call AI literacy among the general population. People need to understand how AI works, the basics of it, and how they can use it, you know, um, how they can put it to good use in their own life. That's important. And then the second, um, the second um, field that is important is regulation. We do need smart regulation that fosters innovation, yes, because there are vast benefits, as Jürgen Schmidhuber pointed out, but that also mitigates the risks for people on the ground. And we need regulation that makes sure that fundamental rights are protected. What that regulation could look like, I want to discuss in just a moment with, with the three of you. But let me just uh, ask a little bit about where the industry stands today. And uh, Raul, as we heard, leading researchers have been issuing warnings, including spokespeople for the leading companies in this area, whether it's Microsoft, OpenAI, or others. But are they walking the talk? Are they now slowing down and prioritizing safety over speed to market? I don't think so. So I was telling before that the big difference uh, between AI in the 90s and AI today is that AI in the 90s was a, an academic project. It was done at the universities. Then many people moved from the universities to these companies, and now companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, and so on, they are leaders in the field of AI. And there is no, there is no way for a university to compete now against uh, these big companies. And it's, a, it's an existential problem for these companies. For example, ChatGTP is, uh, is owned in part by Microsoft, and Google lost a part of his value in the stock market just because they don't have a, an, an equal alternative. And so for these companies, it's an existential threat if they do not develop the AI at the same speed 
uh, that, that other uh, companies are doing, and also especially considering the Chinese companies who are not going to abide by uh, European laws or by American laws. Again, that's a point we'll come back to in just a moment. But if I can go uh, to Judith and pick up on this point. In fact, some critics say that the biggest everyday risk, as Raul has, has called it earlier, is actually not in the technology so much as the business model that it will serve. Uh, whether it's turbo capitalistic search engines that are expert at manipulating us to buy things, or whether it's surveillance capitalism that puts uh, facial surveillance at workplaces that can measure everything from workers' efficiency to their moods. Yeah, I would totally agree. I mean, AI doesn't do anything on its own. It's always people deploying technologies for certain purposes and for certain uh, utilities, and that's the problem. So we're not talking about AI manipulating us, but about people using AI in order to manipulate or control people. And that is indeed the real danger. So I think we must be very careful about all these narratives about AI being sort of like a force of nature and we can't do nothing about it. It's really a lot about shirking responsibility in these discussions. So I think it is important to recognize that it's people doing things and taking decisions and being responsible for what they're doing. So shirking responsibility is something that many accused politicians of for quite some time, but it looks now like they are awakening from their torpor. The European Union will in fact soon begin negotiations on the AI Act that it's hoping will become a global gold standard for risk-based regulation. And interestingly enough, for the first time, it's also working on standards and technical norms at the same time that it negotiates the legislation, which it has never done before. Janusz, do you think that regulators can get out in front of the wave? Well, to be completely honest, you know, the regulation of technology is never really in front of the wave because technology evolves fast and um, you can't fully predict what's going to happen. Um, that being said, I think the EU is on a good path because at the core of this legislative package that's now being negotiated is a risk-based approach. So the idea to uh, um, regulate artificial, in artificial intelligence and its applications according to the risks that it poses to the safety and, and to the fundamental rights of users. And I think that um, is the right approach. And I think that is sort of the approach that will allow lawmakers to adapt that regulation over the next couple of years as technology evolves. Of course, um, the EU's perspective on risk is not necessarily the perspective of, say, China, which Raoul, you mentioned a moment ago. And there is a lot of concern that we could see a race to the bottom in which authoritarian states develop and use this technology, use AI for purposes that we would consider off limits, massive social surveillance, uh, for example. Optimists hope that global standards, global technical norms might be able to prevent that. Are countries like China taking part in standards? Are they amenable to global governance when it comes to AI? I don't think so. I think that China is more interested in copying the technology that's coming from the US or from Europe. And in fact, they were very successful in developing an ecosystem of companies which mirrors the ecosystem in the US. So instead of having Google, they have Baidu. Instead of having Facebook, they have other platforms. And one worrying aspect of that development is that the Chinese were using so-called social points. They were, they were watching what people are doing and then you can get good points or bad points according to your behavior. And that's one example of the kind of uh, misbehavior that we can have in the future. And Judith, just in terms of the success of regulation, if we look at something like general AI, that's AI technology that finds its way into multiple applications across a very complex value chain. How can and should responsibility be allocated for errors, for misfunction? Because this is a, a question where the original creators may have part of the accountability, but shouldn't it also be on the part of the applications? That's a hard question and it's really one to resolve. So basically, 
to a certain degree, what, what is happening in the in the EU is that they try to regulate sector-specific AI applications. So that's one question. You know, you can't regulate AI at once because it's a basic technology. You need to look into very specific applications. And the second question you were addressing is, who's in charge if systems learn and evolve through usage? To a certain degree, this is not an entirely novel problem because even also for other products, you have to disentangle what is a problem of usage and what was a problem that was already in the product before it was um, sent out. So there are some precedents where you can you know, draw upon, but it will be an increasingly prevalent uh, problem. And the question is really, what type of regulation do we need for what type of AI application? Sometimes we may need to have ex ante uh, regulation where you basically need to, need to say, well, we need to regulate in advance and only products which have uh, survived certain scrutiny, which comply to certain standards, quality standards, uh, freedom from bias, etc., can be gone, going to the market. And for others, it will be ex post, so only inspection when something mm -hmm. goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And maybe for some systems that uh, you may have to have real-time assessment if they continue to develop in real time. But that's, Thank of course, you. a minority of systems. Thank you. And very briefly, if I may, May Janusz come back to our title, Are Machines Poised to Take Control? What do you think? Can we get this under control? We can, but you know, this, it's important to have this debate now and it's important to come up with smart rules now to make sure that we reap the benefits of artificial intelligence and that we mitigate the risk and that we don't let it take over. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for being with us. Thanks to our viewers. See you soon.